Welcome to Strip Cover Lit, where we squeeze the bigger picture out of literature. I'm Adrian Fort, and we are here for a short story discussion. This short story coming to us by way of The Dubliners by James Joyce. The short story in question being A Painful Case, which begins on page 77 of Dubliners. Uh, I had to look real quick to see if there was a V involved or not. I can never remember for some reason. So what happens in a painful case? We have our protagonist, James Duffy, who is a lonely type of fella who lives a lonely type of life in a lonely part of town, presumably working a lonely type of job, um, to which he rides the tram and from which he walks. Uh, sometimes he likes to go to concerts. He likes to listen to music. And during one of these outings, he meets a woman named uh, Miss, Mrs. Sinico. And she is at this event with her daughter. And there is a little bit of question as to whether or not this is going to be, at first, uh, an interaction, a story between James and the daughter character. After all, James uh, notices and mentions the fact that the daughter character is around his age. Instead, it becomes a story about the friendship between Mrs. Sinico and James. After all, Mrs. Sinico's husband likes to have guests at the house and does not mind his wife making friends. So she does. And one of those friends is James. And during their dalliance, they talk into the wee hours of the morning and every once in a while, she doesn't even care to keep the lamp lit and they will talk in the dark. During these talks, she encourages him to be engaged more in society. Uh, and his reading tastes change, which we will note later on during his interactions with her, but she's pretty, uh, pretty smitten, it seems, with him. And he seems to like to have someone to talk to. Um, until one night, she deigns to touch him, lays a hand on him, and he does not take too kindly to that. He sort of flips shit a little bit and needs his distance leaves and only uh, dares to meet her once more before abandoning that friendship altogether. Later in the story, it turns out that she has died after being hit by a train. The nature of this, her having been hit by a train, is a bit questionable. Certainly, it happened. Uh, we have a witness stating that is what happened, but was she just hit by a train or did she make sure that it happened? Uh, that is the question of the day, after which James reacts as all loners might when their one friend dies. He becomes angry at the fact that he was ever friends with her and uh, sort of wanders the countryside a little bit. So what are we talking about here with A Painful Case by James Joyce? With Joyce, we often have to start with names. And I will admit, I almost didn't even look into it this time because James Duffy, the name James Duffy, struck me. Do you know the story behind the name James Bond? The story behind the name James Bond is that it was picked by old uh, Ian Fleming. I couldn't remember his name. Ian Fleming picked the name James Bond because it was the most boring sounding, exclusively British sounding name he could think of. James Duffy is about as boring an Irish type name one could probably imagine. However, James means supplanter. What is a supplanter? One who takes the place of 
someone else supplants them. Duffy means son of black. So what are we getting into here? Supplanter, it is completely reasonable when reading into the names in this to think that Mrs. Seneca was looking for someone to supplant her interests, uh, the interest perhaps that she was not getting from her husband. And Son of Black uh, sort of talks a little bit about the, 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 the type of person James is. Uh, he is Saturnine, Saturnine, sanguine. Uh, he's a guy that lives alone and everything is gray and he judges the rest of the world in a cold, harsh manner. Kind of like this guy. And that is James, very alone, very straightforward, uh, gets into Nietzsche, starts reading a little bit of Nietzsche, poetry in Nietzsche, there's nothing wrong with this fella. Um, but the other name involved, Seneco. I do not believe Seneco is a... I'm sure there's someone with the last name Seneco. I don't think it is a name that is as widespread as something like Duffy, which has an accepted beginning, has an accepted meaning. Um, and a writer such as James Joyce is certainly talented enough to make up his own words. So what might Seneca point to? Perhaps cynical. Cynical of what? Tradition, maybe? Um, Mrs. Cynical is rebelling against her marriage. She is rebelling against her marriage and convention with someone young enough that, it, that he might be better suited for her daughter. It's a bit of a rebellion, right? It's uh, taking one's interests into their own hands. And um, I think that is the crux of the matter here. And this is a very short, short story. And there are... There are stories that cry for interpretation, and there are stories that cry for discussion. Um, the former being a story that cries for that sort of decoding that is Dan Brown, Da Vinci Code-esque, right? Uh, you're searching for symbols, searching for meaning, searching for these little... And, and this is something we often do here on the channel. Um, the latter, stories that cry for discussion are those that make a story of the things which are universally important. The humanity. The former being the what, the latter being the why. And the brilliance of James Joyce, um, the reason he's been taught for so long in so many classrooms so many times and always, always will be so long as the English language is spoken is that his stories are supple in both regards. You step into an English classroom at the college level and there are students who are more tilted towards decoding literature. And there are students more tilted towards um, discussing literature. And the vitality of a literature course is somewhere in the middle, where those two things fuse. So you assign Joyce a short story, any of these short stories, and you're going to get an entire period of discussions out of it. Um, this story, however, feels much more like a case of the latter. It feels much more like a discussion piece. Uh, does that mean that there are not things in here to decode? Obviously not. We've already gone through the names. But this feels much more like a story about what are those things which are universal? What are those things 
which tap into the human element of literature. Um, what are those things which make literature literary? And one of the things in this that is so blatant a case for that is the fact that we, we get two glimpses at James's bookcase. At the beginning, he's reading things like Wordsworth, William Wordsworth. And in the middle, he's reading Nietzsche. Why is that important? Let me read you a bit of William Wordsworth, and this is the most cliche Wordsworth because it is the prime Wordsworth. I wandered lonely as a cloud. I wandered lonely as a cloud that floats on high over vales and hills when all at once I saw a crowd, a host of golden daffodils, beside the lake beneath the trees fluttering and dancing in the breeze. Continuous as the stars that shine and twinkle on the Milky Way, they stretched in never-ending line along the margin of the bay. Ten thousand saw I at a glance, tossing their heads in sprightly dance. The waves beside them danced, but they outdid the sparkling waves in glee. A poet could not but be gay in such a jocund com company. I gazed and gazed, but little thought what wealth the show to me had brought. For oft when on my couch I lie in vacant or in pensive mood, they flash upon that inward eye which is the bliss of solitude. And then, in, and then my heart with pleasure fills and dances with the daffodils." So obviously, a little bit of solitude there, but also a bit of whimsy, the whimsical. Um, there is rhyme, there is uh, rhythm there. It has to be observed, and it is stately in its essence, but still it is there. But he gets this friend. So I think that oftentimes when we're at our loneliest, we are forced to construct the self, which is ironic. We are forced to construct the self when we're alone so that we have some parameters upon which to act versus when we have company and we bounce off of that company more naturally being ourselves. So when there's no one else there to bounce off of, you have to bounce off of something. So you construct these walls that are the self. And we see this with James at the beginning of the story. James is a quirky character who notices strange things. And he notices them because he has his distance from them. He notices the uh, out-of-work distillery because he's at a distance and he's allowed to observe it. But when he gets a friend, Mrs. Sinico, he's able to be more genuinely him without constructing those walls. He is able to react to the things that he wants to react to, to, and we've all noticed this, when we're able to tell a story rather than think about it, when we're able to tell that story, sometimes a more genuine emotion comes across versus, for example, uh, you get cut off in traffic and it's just you in the car, you're, you're on your way to work. You get mad, you flip the guy the bird, you scream some curse words. You're building the self. This is what a person does. A person gets mad, so I get mad. And a person says all those nasty words they know, so I say all those nasty words I know. Versus when you're with someone um, and a, a person cuts you off, this son of a bitch, god damn it, and you just carry on. You were able to diffuse that situation when there is someone to bounce those ideas off of. When James is able to become more authentically himself, his reading tastes change, and he brings home Nietzsche. Now, remember Wordsworth. 
The waves beside them dance, but they outdid the sparkling waves in glee. A poet could not but be gay in such a joke and company. I gazed and gazed, but little thought what wealth to me this show had brought. Now I want to share with you, quite possibly, the proto-Nietzsche quote. Now this is not a Nietzsche quote from either Thus Spake Zarathustra or... The Gay Science, this quote is from Beyond Good and Evil, but it is such a Nietzsche, Nietzsche quote that there's no mistaking it for anyone else's. He who fights with monsters must take care, lest he thereby become a monster. And if you gaze long into an abyss, the abyss gazes also into you. That's Nietzsche. That is James when he is his most comfortable. What does that mean? What are we to make of James? When James has an ear, this, so this is the transition he makes when he has a friend. What was the short road onto a long life that James was taking? Um, because we, we do get that reaction when he reads of her death in the newspaper, uh, he reacts as such. Where are we at here? What a, He reacts to the fact that she got hit by a train and died. Um, we're sort of left to believe as a suicide. What an end. The whole narrative of her death revolted him, and it revolted him to think that she that he had ever spoken to her of what he held sacred. He was revolted that he had shared himself with her. He was revolted at the very thought of her. This is what he says when he hears about her death. It's a pretty crummy reaction, right? But why is that? There is some trepidation in James. For the fact that he must be coming to terms with the fact that this was a potential affair, that there was more interest there than just listening to him spout Nietzschean ideas about the Marxists that he met in the bar, which, by the way, Guys, if you meet a woman who's willing to listen to those stories, she's in love with you. If you meet a woman who's willing to listen to you talk about Nietzsche, she's in love with you. Just putting it out there. Maybe that's the life lesson to have from this short story. But he's coming to terms with the fact, and he is wrestling with what it means about himself. What does it mean about him that he was so close to that situation? He was so close to cuckolding someone. Um, and during this wandering, he comes to the conclusion um, his life would be lonely too until he Two died, ceased to exist, became a memory, if anyone remembered him. And that, I think, that is the heart of this. This is someone who has known themselves only as a loner and is coming to that dastardly realization that a loner must come to, that they may not, probably will not, be remembered. And there's two ways to handle that. One way, good. I do not aim to be remembered. But that is not someone who comes across themselves as James has come across James this entire time remember, has been harsh and judgmental. Why 
might a loner be harsh and judgmental, not because that loner feels that they are not worth remembering, that they are not worth the company that they may have, but because they are better than that company. This constructing of the self up to something better, up onto a scaffolding to look down on other people. Um, this does not necessarily mean that's how a person truly feels about themselves, but there are basically two ways for a loner to look at that. Good, I don't want to be remembered, and oh shit, no one's going to remember me. Um, and a lot of that comes down to the fight in the individual. James is an individual that has a lot of fight. And when he's faced with that realization, no one's going to remember you. You haven't made your mark. You've left it all behind. You're on that short path to a long, quiet life. He flips out a little bit. Um, and while he's wandering around, just sort of marinating in this anger, he's coming to realizations, coming slowly to realizations. And um, during this marinating stage, he's walking around the places that the two of them had walked around the last time they had met. And he, he sort of breaks down. Um, and this is, this is something is very natural this transition, but we're not shown it in the text. We're just given the thoughts. Why had he withheld life from her? Why had he sentenced her to death? He felt his moral nature falling to pieces. This is that Nietzschean nihilism, falling to pieces. Uh, I often quote Pizarev, uh, on this channel. Uh, the seminal quote to me for nihilism is this quote about um, strike out left, strike out right. What, what falls to smithereens is worthless. What will stand the blow is good. That's sort of the seminal nature of nihilism. But it turns out many people come to the realization nothing will withstand the blow. Nothing is good enough. So it's an all or nothing gamble with nihilism. And James is coming to the fact that it's nothing. And why did he sentence her to death? Why did he withhold life from her? Why did he walk away from her? It was all or nothing and he chose the nothing because she wanted it all. She wanted to corrupt him morally. Maybe a little moral corruption is good for you now and again. And he's gazing out, thinking of the woman who encouraged him to be more engaged in the world. Um, and he sees a pair of lovers. And then, beyond the river, he saw a goods train winding out of Kingsbridge, Kingsbridge Station like a worm with a fiery head, winding through the darkness, obstinately and laboriously. It passed slowly out of sight, but still he heard in his ears the laborious drone of the engine, reiterating the syllables of her name. That train is life. The goods that it is holding is that love that she had for him, that relationship that she had for him, a little bit of corruption that she had for him. Um, and he refused it. And so the train's leaving. And the symbol that we have that that train looks like is a worm winding through the darkness. 
Worms are symbols of death. The worms come for you when nothing else will. And that is what we're left with. Because the last line is, well, the last couple lines here. He waited for some minutes listening. He could hear nothing. The night was perfectly silent. There's that perfection, that everything. He listened again, perfectly silent. He felt that he was alone. James has been alone this entire story, but he's never been lonely. When you start feeling lonely, it's probably that you're not an actual loner. It's probably some mechanism in you has switched and no longer are you fit for the lonesomeness because you will feel lonely. A true loner is never lonely, or at least rarely so. But here we are. James goes from being alone and pretty happy about it to having a friend, losing that friend, and now he's lonely. That is the beauty of James Joyce. Uh, so that was A Painful Case from Dubliners by James Joyce. It really helps me out here on the channel if you hit that like button. If you know someone who likes James Joyce or is perhaps taking a college literature class in which they will most definitely have to read James Joyce, perhaps consider sharing this video with them. Uh, hit the subscribe button if you have not already and you would like to keep up with Strip Cover Lit. And I hope to see you here for the next video on the channel. Alone. But not lonely. Never lonely. Simply on one's own. By yourself. Just you. Just you.